Hello and welcome. This is the Daily News Simplified and I am Ankit. Now in today's Daily News Simplified, that is 20th of March, we will be covering 9 different articles. So without wasting your time, let's just start with the first article of the day, which you can see appeared in the Hindu newspaper. Now before moving forward, let me highlight that there is a need to like, share and subscribe this video as it helps us to keep motivated. Now, as you understand, this article is written by a former India's ambassador to Bhutan. Now, in the title of today's article, it is highlighted India's neighborhood first policy. Now, although this article was written in context of Bhutan and India relation, however, I will take this example to highlight how has India's approach towards its immediate neighborhood changed over a period of few decades. Now this topic, it is important from primarily GS paper to syllabus because the syllabus, it highlights India and its neighborhood and its relation with other countries. Also, you can see from this two examples that UPSC has taken a key interest in this topic as the question has appeared multiple times over a period of past few years. So, let us understand what is India's approach towards its own immediate neighborhood and how has it evolved over a period of few decades. Now to start off with India's approach to its immediate neighborhood, we go back in 1950s. And this was the time when Pandit Nehru was India's first Prime Minister of the country. Now as per his personality, India's approach towards its neighborhood was determined by idealism. Why? Because India, it primarily engaged with its neighboring countries in a bilateral format. By bilaterally, I mean that India engaged in isolation with each and every country. And this was a period of quite a huge significance. Because first of all, India signed treaty of friendship with not just Bhutan, but also Nepal. And with respect to China, India signed what was known as Panchil Agreement. And this was done in the year 1954. So you can see India not just signed bilateral agreements with Bhutan and Nepal, but it also tried to have a cooperative relationship with China with respect to this Panchil Treaty. But everything changed since the decades of 1960. Because since 1962 and between 1971, India was engaged in three wars. That was with China in 1962 and with Pakistan in the year 1965 and 1971. Now this changed India's approach towards its neighborhood entirely. Because this was the time when Mrs. Indira Gandhi was India's Prime Minister and, he be and she became very regionally assertive. And this policy, it paid both rich dividends and it also damaged India's reputation somehow. And let me highlight how. First of all, India was able to liberate Bangladesh from the clutches of Pakistan. And this paid rich dividends to India's security architecture. Because we were able to eliminate our enemy which was surrounding us from two sides. Hence, Pakistan, it became just restricted to India's western part of the borders. Now also, India was able to integrate Sikkim into itself. And this was in the year 1975. Whereas on the other hand, Indra's Gan Indra Gandhi's son, that was Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, he intervened in Sri Lankan political crisis. That was a battle between Sri Lankan government and Sri Lankan Tamils. And to intervene in Sri Lanka's tumultuous regime, what Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi did was that he decided to send Indian peacekeeping force in Sri Lanka back in 1987. Now this approach, it was seen as India's intrusion in Sri Lanka's own domestic matter. So you can say that it in a way damaged India's reputation in eyes of its own neighbor. Because India was seen as somewhat which was imposing its own ideology over other countries. 
so it was decided especially in the decades of 1990s that india has to play the role of responsible big brother and in this context there are two important developments the first was gujral doctrine as this was a kind of policy that was favored by then prime minister indra kumar gujral now this development first of all is very important because gujral he was primarily a indian diplomat who was india's ambassador to the soviet union so you can understand his approach towards bilateral and multilateral relationship was somewhat driven by his own understanding of diplomacy so he understood that india has to concede to its smaller neighbors primarily based on the principle of mutual or unilateral concession that india has to make some economic and political concessions to its smaller neighbors and it cannot expect the same from themselves because they are smaller neighbors understood so in this regard let us first understand what constituted the gujral doctrine now this doctrine it highlighted that india will not seek reciprocity from its neighbors if it makes any concession and also india will pay a key respect to any nation's sovereignty so in this regard what india did was it decided to not interfere in the domestic matters of any its neighboring countries and also it decided to settle all the disputes bilaterally so this is what the crux is of the gujral doctrine now in the early or late 2000s india approached a neighborhood first policy but it is not something of a radical departure from gujral doctrine rather it is a logical extension of the gujral doctrine itself because first of all through neighborhood first policy india highlighted that it will follow the five s principle with relation to its neighbors that is the principle of samvad that is dialogue samman that is respect and this is done to achieve shanti and samriddhi which are hindi terms for peace and tranquility also india looked to forward its sanskriti that is culture so this is what constituted the elements of 5s now with respect to 2014 and onwards india also took a somewhat iterative approach to this neighborhood first policy and by this india emphasized a greater emphasis on regional cooperation and this was done in order to achieve economic cooperation provide countries with development assistance and also to deal with shared challenges that is disaster management as well as the problem of climate change with countries in togetherness so this is what india's neighborhood first policy is all about that you have to give due respect to your neighbors and by giving due respect you want to achieve the tenets of economic cooperation provide them with development assistance and also deal with the problems in a shared manner so understood this is what was evolution of india's neighborhood policy now why is india's neighborhood important for its own ambition let us deal with this answer on a three pillared approach the first pillar is that india needs to take care of its strategic interest understood so first of all you have to understand that india is a key regional power not just in south asia but also in the indian ocean region so naturally india has to project its power both on the land and also over the sea and by projecting its regional power throughout the region india wants to play or wants to establish its regional dominance in the entire south asia and this is india's strategic interest and also india wants to contain the influence of or influence of china in the region because influence of india and china you can see it is a zero sum game because wherever in india's neighborhood the influence of china's increases it in a way eats upon india's influence in the region 
So naturally, if India wants to maintain or establish its dominance in the region, it has to contain or check the rise of China in the region. And this is India's prime strategic interest with respect to its immediate neighborhood. Also, you can understand that India's neighboring countries, they are also members of important global bodies such as United Nations, World Trade Organizations and United Nations Framework for Climate Change. So you can understand wherever India's interest in these global bodies are concerned, India has to seek the support of its neighboring countries. So this is what India's strategic interest with respect to its neighborhood is all about. Now let us deal with India's security interest. Now naturally, India has more than 7500 kilometers of its border region with other countries. And India wants to protect its border, especially from the menace of terrorism and infiltration of illegal migrants. So this is India's territorial integrity is all about that it has to ensure peace and tranquility in the neighborhood. Because by ensuring peace and tranquility, India will ensure that terrorists and illegal migrants will not come or enter India's territory. So this is all about territorial security of India. And also India has a long coastal region, not just with respect to India's mainland, but also with respect to its two key islands, that is Andaman and Nicobar and Lakshadweep Islands. And India has to protect its maritime region also. And in this regard, India's maritime security interest, it is also a key factor that India has to take care of its uh, maritime neighbors such as Sri Lanka, Maldives and also neighboring countries such as Myanmar and Bangladesh. So this is what India's security interest is all about. And a peaceful neighborhood will also ensure that India's security interest is ideally taken care of. Now let us deal with India's economic interest in particular. Now there are three aspects to it. First of all, it's India is looking to ensure its energy security. And in this regard, nations such as Bhutan and Nepal, they play a key role. Because these two nations, they have a huge hydropower potential. So if India were to harness clean and cheap energy, India will have to harness the hydropower from these two nations. And hence, taking care or ensuring peace and tranquility and development in these two key nations are important as far as India's energy security or energy requirement is concerned. Now, let us understand another key aspect of India's economic interest is that India wants to achieve higher levels of development in its northeastern region. Because naturally, you can understand that India's northeastern part is somewhat less economically developed than other parts of the country. And India wants to ensure high levels of economic development in northeastern region. So in this regard, India is looking to provide quick connectivity initiatives in northeastern region in order to bypass the Siliguri corridor, which is also known as chicken neck. So India wants to develop connectivity projects with Myanmar as well as Bangladesh in order to deliver or deliver its goods to northeastern region in a quicker and cheaper manner. So this is what India's economic interest with respect to development of northeastern region is all about. Now let us also understand that India wants to play a key role in trade with other countries. Now naturally, Countries such as Bangladesh, Nepal, as well as Myanmar, they have a huge population density. And also being economically less developed in India, which means that India has a potential to increase its export to these countries. So naturally, India wants to achieve high level of trade with these countries and this creates an economic interest with respect to India's neighborhood. So this is what is important about India's neighborhood and why is India making huge efforts to influence its own neighboring countries. Now naturally India is facing multiple challenges in this regard. So let us deal or let us understand what are the key challenges that India face with respect to its neighborhood policy. 
and the first and probably the most highlighted upon challenge is India's security risk. Because as I've already highlighted, India is witnessing large flux of terrorists which are primarily from nations such as Pakistan. Whereas also, India is facing insurgency in its northeastern region which is primarily done through launch pads which are located in Myanmar. Also, India is known in to be in close proximity with drug growing regions such as Golden Crescent which is in India's western side and also Golden Triangle which is on India's or which is very near to India's eastern borders. So, in this regard, India also has to provide the influx of or India has to prevent the influx of contraband in its domestic territory. Further, nations such as Bangladesh, it is also seen that India is witnessing a huge, huge influx of contraband, human trafficking as well as animal trafficking from nations such as Bangladesh. And these are all the highlights that India faces in terms of security risk. So, this is what has deteriorated India's relationship primarily with respect to Pakistan. Because Pakistan primarily has not been able to deal with India's concern with relation to terrorist. On the other hand, it has not just not able to deal with India's concern, but it has also favoured the terrorist or the movement of terrorist into the country. So, this has created what is called a enmity between India and Pakistan. Now, also what we have witnessed that in many countries, China is making inroads, especially in countries such as Sri Lanka. We have seen that China has played a key role in economic development of Sri Lanka. But on the other hand, China has also extended Sri Lanka with some economic loans. And as Sri Lanka has not been able to pay them back, China has taken some of the key assets under its control, especially with respect to Humban Tota port. So, this has created a sense of insecurity in eyes of India. Because first of all, China is not just influencing its neighbours such as Sri Lanka and Myanmar economically, but it, it is also involved actively in these countries' domestic politics. So, not just economically, but politically, China is making inroads in India's neighborhood. And all these two factors has combined in form of strained bilateral relationship with not just China and Pakistan, but also with other countries, especially that of Maldives. Because political parties in these countries, they are primarily favoring China. And this has negatively affected India's influence in these countries. Now also India's domestic policies or politics, it plays a key role with respect to its relation with other neighbours. For example, for long India has been able, is trying to implement what is known as Tista Water Agreement with that of Bangladesh. But on the other hand, the implementation or signing of this agreement was not agreed upon by the West Bengal government. Because West Bengal government, it feels that this agreement will negatively affect the interest of people of West Bengal. So, the government is against India signing this Tista water agreement. Now, with respect to Sri Lanka, India has been or has been sensitive with respect to matters of Sri Lankan Tamils. Because this is a emotional or emotive issue in the eyes of Tamil Nadu politics. While on the other hand, India interfering in Sri Lanka's domestic politics, it negatively affects India's bilateral relationship with Sri Lanka. So you can see, domestic politics, especially in West Bengal and Tamil Nadu, has impacted India's relationship with Bangladesh and Sri Lanka respectively. And this was domestic politics as risk with regards of India's domestic politics. Now also domestic politics in countries like Sri Lanka, Nepal and Bangladesh, they also witness huge polarization. When one political actor, they favour India, whereas on the other hand, other political actors, they favour China. So based on which political actor is in power, India's relationship 
with these countries they either face flow or they face ebb so this is what effect of domestic politics in both countries they affect india's equations with its neighboring countries now also india's immediate neighborhood is in witness of numerous crises for example pakistan and sri lanka they are witnessing huge economic crisis in the country whereas on the other hand myanmar for some time now has been witnessing what is known as a humanitarian crisis because the regime which is in power in myanmar it is prosecuting the rohingya muslims now this negatively affects india how because when rohingyas are prosecuted in their entire homeland then they will decide to migrate from bangladesh and into india which will create a migration crisis or illegal migrant crisis in the country so you can understand crisis in india's neighborhood especially with respect to humanitarian and economic crisis it negatively affects india's neighborhood and when countries like pakistan and sri lanka they face economic crisis it invites china in a way to influence its domestic and economic policies so this in a way will negatively affects india's overall interest in the region understood now recently india in order to deal with crisis in the neighborhood has promised implementation of some key economic as well as financial projects for example india is constructing what is known as bbn initiatives and in this initiative india is undertaking some development of key infrastructural projects such as roads and railways also with respect to myanmar india is undertaking the development of sitwe port because through this port india intends to export its goods in order to bypass the chicken corridor and deliver its goods to northeastern region in a quicker manner also to deal with uh, the crisis that are faced by sri lankan tamils india is also undertaking construction of housing projects in sri lanka now the implementation of these three key projects have been facing several delays now these delays it has led to sense of frustration mistrust and it in a way reduces india's influence in these countries so you can understand not just the delayed implementation of project but crisis in the neighborhood effect of domestic policies influence of china as well as security risk has strained india's bilateral relationship with the countries and it has also negatively affected india's influence in the region now with this discussion a naturally a question might appear in your mind that can india do anything about it and as the answer would suggest obviously india can do much more about it because first of all india is a key military and an economic player in the region but india it also has to understand that it cannot take everything itself so the key idea in its road ahead is that india should ensure rejuvenating the regional forums in the region because naturally the amount of economic and social integration in the india's immediate neighborhood is historically quite low when compared to other world regions now in this regard bodies such as sark bimstec as well as indian ocean rim organization or association it can play a key role in forwarding india's interest because in these forums india can engage with its partners multilaterally it can also take sustained dialogues and these multilateral engagement and dialogue would not just reduce the trust deficit between the various governments but will also give india an opportunity to present great opportunity to its own neighborhoods and with these regional forums india can look to integrate the regional countries into its economic and political architecture in a much more better manner and also the second suggestion in this regard is that india should engage or should look to engage china in a more constructive manner 
and in this regard as india's finance uh, sorry foreign minister has already highlighted that india it needs to first solve the land and border dispute that it has with china because this problem is the crux of problem that is replete with india and china relationship and until unless india and china they are not able to solve this particular problem their own relations would be very much hostile so in this regard engaging with the china is an ideal solution for a more peaceful and tranquil neighborhood and also india's biggest security risk in this region has been the rise of terrorism in the country and in this regard countries such as bangladesh bhutan and myanmar they have been somewhat sensitive to india's security interest and upon indian government request these countries have taken measures to crack down on the insurgents that live in their own territory but on the other hand countries such as pakistan has had a hostile approach towards india and to deal with countries such as pakistan in order to reduce the menace of terrorism india has primarily cooperating with global powers such as us as well as israel now also this is a key important uh, measure in order to reduce the menace of terrorism because there is a global body called financial action task force and it penalizes country which tries to pro propagate the ideology or menace of terrorism so india can utilize this particular platform to curb or to impose curbs on pakistan and also probably the most important suggestion in this regard is that india should involve in a sustained engagement with its smaller neighbors and in this regard india needs to take three important steps first of all that india should increase its connectivity with these countries because with the increasing connectivity india will not just ensure more people to people contact but will also favor more business to business contact so it in a way will start promoting movement of people and businesses across india's neighborhood also india should look to encourage tourism both to and from india and with this tourism and connectivity initiatives india can improve people to people contact with its smaller neighbors and in this regard india should also undertake environment cooperation with these smaller countries because naturally in coming times the menace that is of global warming and climate change will impact all these countries in a similar manner so we have to understand that india and other neighbors they should involve or they should engage constructively in order to deal with problems that surpass their own geographical boundaries hence this was all about india's neighborhood policy with this we move to the next article of the day which you can see appeared in the business line newspaper now recently a committee on digital competition law it presented its report which favored for a separate digital competition law in india now newspapers on the past one week have been replete with debates arguing both for bringing a separate digital competition law and as today's article suggests not for bringing a separate digital law now in this regard we'll discuss whether there is a need to bring a separate digital law in the country and this is important from gs paper to syllabus because the syllabus highlights government policies and interventions in development of various sectors now first of all let us understand what kind of anti competitive practices that digital companies in india they are involved in and the first example is that companies they are involved in self preferencing for example there are set of products in amazon which are known as amazon basics as the products they are having this branding they are manufactured by amazon with its partners so when when you search for a particular product on amazon and the search result it first highlights an amazon basic products it is an example of self preferencing but because rather than giving you the best or the cheapest option amazon is suggesting you with a product which is manufactured by its own so this is an example of self preferencing 
the second example is that these companies are involved in bundling and tying practices because to purchase any item from amazon you are required to utilize its own payment gateway that are known as amazon pay and this restricts the payment gateway made by other companies let me under help you understand with this another example for example when you book a cab on ola you have to pay the amount using ola money itself whereas on the other hand you cannot utilize the services provided by other payment providers such as phone pay or even for that matter amazon pay to pay on ola so this is an example that companies they are forcing you to utilize a tied payment services in order to pay for their services so it in a way restricts competition in the economy also when these companies these big tech companies they see any small startup which may be com which may be able to compete with them in a the near future they decide to either merge those entities into it or they decide to purchase those entities so this is primarily seen as an attempt by big tech companies to eliminate its competition in the longer run also you can see that many of the companies especially that of swiggy and zomato they are involved in deep discounting practices because whenever you purchase a food in swiggy and zomato they are offering you discounts with that of 75 to 100 rupees now the this deep discounting practices by established companies it in a way reduces competition because a new company which may be able to undertake food delivery will not be able to give you such deep discounts therefore it tries to restrict the competition in the economy further many of the companies or e-commerce companies they are involved in exclusive tie ups for example before you can only buy oneplus mobile through an amazon website where the same mobiles they were not available on other e-commerce platforms such as flipkart so this exclusive tie ups they force users to utilize only one kind of services which in a way also restricts the competition further you can see that most of the uh, big tech companies they are involved in restricting third party apps because for example if you have an iphone you can only download the apps through what is known as app store so any app maker they have to be enrolled their app into this particular app store for you to be able to download that particular app and for example if amazon in future it decides to restrict or it decides against enlisting apps of its rivals this in a way will affect the competition in the economy so these were the examples that of anti competitive practices that big tech companies in india are currently involved in so if any of these big tech companies are involved in anti competitive practices naturally for any company the recourse is available with that of competition commission of india and the nature of these recourses they are termed as ex post measures because these measures they are primarily curative in nature because first of all any wrong doing by big tech companies has to happen then when a company faces a wrong doing by a big tech company it can complain to the competition commission of india and based on that complaint the competition commission of india will investigate and then it will pass an order for restricting the use of anti competitive prices but the problem with these curative or ex post measures is that it is a time taking process now when these are time consuming process it will mean that it will irreparably damage the players that are there in india's digital markets so in this regard the report by digital competition commission it has highlighted the link need to bring ex anti measures along with curative measures now what are these ex anti measures these are known as preventive measures which can be undertaken even before the wrong doings are happening because companies are of the opinion that curative measures although they are effective but they are also time taking in process so you have to reduce the 
time and by this you can implement the ex ante measures and these can prevent the big tech companies from indulging in anti competitive practices and in this regard the committee has also made certain measures regarding what kind of a uh, companies will be under this new anti competition or anti digital competition law and also what were the obligations which will be there on these companies and if these companies are unable to fulfill the obligations then these companies will be subjected to penalty which can be either restrictive penalty or it can also be monetary penalties now the key recommendations of the committee they are provided in the notes below which you can refer to after the session ends correct so with this we move to the third article of the day which you can see appeared in the indian express newspaper now if you look at this particular article closely you can understand that the world currently is witnessing what is known as a gpu wave now these gpu they are graphic processing units which are primarily used to process images and videos and now these gpus or graphic processing units they are powerful processors which are primarily used to process images and videos but of lately the usage of these gpus have surpassed not just images and videos but they have been used for multiple uses in recent times now this news article it is important from gs paper 3 syllabus because first of all the syllabus highlights awareness in the fields of computers now let us first understand what are these gpus now as i have already highlighted they are a kind of processing unit now these gpus they are having multiple features the first is that they are bundled with what is known as streaming multi processors now these gpus they have what is known as multiple cores now these multiple cores they function concurrently which means that these gpus they are able to distinguish various kind of memory hierarchies because some kind of uh, <coughs> i'm sorry now some kind of uh, memories they require higher processing whereas on the other hand some kind of memories they require somewhat lower processing and these gpus they have a memory hierarchy and based on multiple cores and memory hierarchy these gpus they are able to achieve what is known as processing in a parallel manner so you can un they can undertake processing in a simultaneous manner thereby requiring more processing output now this is the key feature that are embedded in graphic processing units and this makes them different from what are known as computing processing units or cpus because every computer be it our mobile phones or laptops they are embedded with what is known as a central processing unit which means you give a key input to any computer system it will process that the input in the cpu and this will give us a particular output now this is what a cpu is all about now this is quite different from gpu because gpu although it also processes data but it primarily uses this parallel processing feature to process data which makes it more different or somewhat different than cpu so you can understand this cpu it ensures quick processing of data whereas on the other hand when the input or output is quite high you require what is known as a gpu which means this is or this in requires high throughput of data which means when the amount of input or outputs are more then you require what is known as graphics processing unit also these gpus they are much faster than cpus although this cpu have more powerful cores however the amount of cores in cpus they are somewhat less whereas on the other hand these gpus they are 
embedded with less powerful cores. However, the amount of cores in these GPUs, they are quite high, which means that the amount of parallel processing that are undertaken in GPU is quite high. Therefore, you can understand that CPUs, they are more appropriate for serial processing of data, whereas on the other hand, these GPUs, they are more useful for parallel processing of data. And so in this regard, wherever the amount of data required to process is quite high, and these areas has been adequate for use case of GPUs. And the probably the most earliest example of use case of these GPUs, they are in the fields of gaming. Because these games, they require high amount of image and graphics processing. And these were done by GPUs in particular. But of lately, we have seen development in generative artificial intelligence tool such as that of chat GPT. Now these artificial or generative intelligence models, they require processing of huge data in order to train these AI softwares. And the best use of high processing units is can be found in these GPUs, which have found increased use case in that of development of generative AI tools. Also, you can see that mining of cryptocurrency can also be achieved by these GPUs because mining, it is a power intensive and time taking process, which can be fastened by the use of these graphing processing units. Also, the uh, use of uh, computational biology as well as drug discovery, it requires high amount of processing in order to detect or in order to simulate or analyze what can be the output of a particular drug. Hence, in this regard, the use of GPU has also been seen in these cases. Further, with respect to financial modeling, on what kind of output will a stock market or any financial market will give, this can be also be achieved by use of these GPUs. Further, we can see the use of autonomous vehicle is increasing day by day. And these autonomous vehicle, they also not re they require real-time object detection and also they need to simulate or need to make decisions in a quick manner and all these can be achieved by increasing use of graphic processing units so you can understand that use of gpus they are not just used in gaming services but they are also being increasingly used in training of generative ai tools increasing mining for cryptocurrencies more and more drug discovery increasing use in financial modeling as well as in use in autonomous vehicles. Now let us move to the next set of articles. The first of which you can see appeared in the Hindu newspaper. Now in this News article, it highlights that Airport's Economic Regulatory Authority or AERA has undertaken certain steps against the Adani control Tiruvananpuram port. Now, this is a regulatory body which is important from GS Paper 2 perspective. Further, questions related to regulatory body has also been asked by UPSC before, primarily in the year of 2019. So you can understand that this particular body is important from prelims perspective. Now, what is this airports regulatory authority? Now this body, it is a statutory body because it was established or constituted under airports economic regulatory authority of India act back in the year 2008. Now this was constituted based on the recommendation of Naresh Chandra committee. Because more and more, India has been trying to privatize or give private parties the operation control of its airports. And in this regard, you need an economic regulator which will influence or which will decide upon what kind of tariffs these private bodies will charge. So let us discuss what are the functions of this particular body. Now, this particular regulatory authority, it regulates tariff and other charges for major airports only. Now, what are these major airports? Those airports are major airports that witness 
annual passenger traffic of at least 35 lakhs in a year. Further, for other airports rather than major airports, the tariff regulated or the body which regulates tariff are the airport operators themselves based on the guidance of AERA. Further, this regulatory body it also monitors the set standards of performance, particularly with respect to quality, continuity and reliability of services and it also determines the tariff once in a period of 5 years. Understood? So, based on this information, let us solve the practice question. Consider the following statements with respect to AERA. The first statement, it is a statutory body, which is a correct statement because this body was constituted under Airport Economic Regulatory Authority of India Act back in the year 2008. The second statement, it was set up based on the recommendation of Naresh Chandra Committee. Again, it is a correct statement. Now, the third statement, it sets tariff for only major airports in India. Now, although this is an absolute statement, but it is a correct statement. Because for airports which are, which are other than major airports, the tariff are fixed by airport operators themselves. So, based on this discussion, the correct answer to this question is option C. Now, let us move to the next article of the day, which you can see also appeared in the Hindu newspaper. Now, the context of this article is that Lokpal, which is an anti-corruption body, it has asked the Central Bureau of Investigation to probe cash for query scam against a formal Trinmul Congress MP. Now, this is also important from GS paper to perspective because the syllabus deals with statutory bodies. Now, also questions related to India's legal jurisprudence has been a key area of interest for UPSC because from this PYQ of the year 2022, you can see a question was asked on bar councils and other legal requirements. So, in this context, let us first understand what is this Lokpal body. Now, this Lokpal, it was established under the Act that is Lokpal and Lokayukta's Act of the year 2013. Now, this Act, it provides a uniform anti-corruption roadmap both for center through constitution of Lokpal and at state level through constitution of Loka Yuktas. Now the jurisdiction of this Lokpal, it extends to all public servants that are group A, B, C and D employees and in addition to political executives such as prime ministers, other ministers as well as members of the parliament. So, this is quite a wide jurisdiction where not even the prime minister of the country is excluded from the jurisdiction of Lokpal. Further, there are this body is headed by a chairperson and it's also consists of eight other members out of which 50% should be judicial members. Now, the membership, it is filled by a selection committee which comprises of Prime Minister of India, Speaker of Lok Sabha, Leader of the Opposition in Lok Sabha, Chief Justice of India or any other Supreme Court judge which is nominated by Chief Justice of India and an eminent jurist who is appointed by the President of India. So, this five-member committee, it forms a selection committee which makes selection to the members of Lokpal based on the recommendation of a search committee. Now, the rest of the details based on which what constitutes search committee and what were the latest amendments made to the Lokpal Act are given in the notes which you can refer after the session ends. Now, based on this information, let us now solve the practice question. With reference to Office of Lokpal, consider the following statements. The first statement, the Office of the Prime Minister is excluded from the purview of Lokpal, which for sure is an incorrect statement because as I have already highlighted, even the Prime Ministers and other Cabinet Ministers, they are included in the jurisdiction of Lokpal. 
Now the jurisdiction of Lokpal, it covers only Group A and Group B employees, which is again an incorrect statement because it also covers employees who belong to Group C and Group D services. Also, the complaint against a public servant cannot be made after expiry of 7 years. Now, Section 53 of the Lokpal and Lokayuktas Act of 2013, it highlights that a complaint cannot be made after the period of 7 years. So, this third statement is a correct statement. Now, the correct answer to this practice question is option A as only third statement was correct. Now, with this, let us move to the next article of the day, which you can see appeared in all three newspapers. Now, this is an important United Nation body, which is World Meteorological Organization. Now, questions related to publications of various environmental organizations, they are important from Prince's perspective, which you can see with this previous year question of year 2018. So, let us understand what is this World Meteorological Organization. Now, it is a specialized agency of United Nations. It is not a principal organ, but a specialized agency. Correct. Now, this body, it ensures that international cooperation and coordination, it takes place between states in order to regulate the behavior of Earth's atmosphere. That is land, ocean, weather and climate and utilization of these resources. Now, in this regard, this World Meteorological Organization, it facilitates and promotes integrated system of observation network, which is very much required if you have to undertake the collection of weather related data. And to store this data, this body also provides its services or development of data management centers and telecommunication systems. Now, these are other important steps which are taken by World Meteorological Organizations. Now, with respect to what are important publications of this body. Now, as you can see from this news article, this body recently published the State of Global Climate Report. Now, other important publications, they are given in the notes which is given in the description box. So you can refer to this important publication after the session ends. Now, with this limited information, let us solve this practice question. Now, WMO, it is a principal organ of the United Nations, which is incorrect because there are six principal organs and WMO, it is not a principal organization. Rather, it is a specialized agency. So, this is a incorrect statement. Now, emissions gap report, it is released by WMO, which again is an incorrect statement because this emission gap report was released by World Economic Forum. Now, the third statement, WMO, it facilitates establishment of an integrated earth system observation network, which we know for this discussion is a correct statement. So, the answer to this model question is option A. Now, let us move to the next set of article which appeared in the Hindu newspaper. Now, this news article, it highlights that states they are able to raise or they have raised a record amount of more than 50,000 crores from the market. Now, this has increased the bond yield of state governments. Now, what is this bond yield and why is this bond yield important? Because first of all, bond yield is a measure of mobilization of resources, thereby making this topic important from GS Paper 3 syllabus. Further, the question appeared in 2021 on the factors that influence Indian government's bond yield. So, let us now understand what is bond price and bond yield. Now, for example, you decide to buy a 100 rupees bond. Now, this 100 rupees, it is known as bond price. Now, this is bond is a debt instrument, which means that when you have bought this particular bond, it must have highlighted that you will be given a 5% per annum return. Which means after a period of one year, when you return this bond, you will get a sum total of 105 rupees. Which means the bond yield of this bond is 5%. Now, suppose you are required or require this 100 rupees money on an urgent basis. So, for that matter, you go to secondary market and then you sell this bond for 95 rupees. 
but originally the bond price was 100 rupees and the return that this bond promise was 5%. So whenever the person who has brought your bond, he or she decides to sell that bond after the maturity date, he or she will get 105 rupees. Correct. So this means that the bond yield that the buyer has got is 10.5%. So you can understand when the bond price decreased from rupees 100 to 95, it increased the bond yield from 5% to 10.5%. So the bond yield, it is indirectly proportional to the bond prices, which means when the bond prices reduces, it will increase the bond yield, which is highlighted by this particular example. Now let us understand how our demand of bonds influenced. Because when the demand of bond increases, it will also mean that the prices of bond increase, which will have an effect on bond yield. Now, whenever there is an increased inflation in the country, it will automatically signify the market that the central government of that country will increase the policy rates. Hence, it will mean that bondholders will look to invest their money in other policy instruments which will reduce the demand for bond in any country and by when the bond of the demand of the bond increases it will naturally mean that the market price will also reduce in a drastic manner and this will increase the bond deal which is also known as hardening of bond deal now sale of government securities by central bank it will increase the supply of bonds in the market thereby it will also reduce the prices of bonds. Again, when the prices of bond reduces, it will also mean that the bond yield increases. Correct. Now also increased borrowing by the government will also increase the supply of the bonds and will also reduce the confidence that the investors have in the government. So this will mean that the prices of the bond, they will also reduce thereby hardening or increasing the yield. Whereas on the other hand, deflationary trends in an economy, it will mean that the government or the central bank will reduce policy rates, thereby making bonds more attractive. And when bonds are more attractive, their market prices increase, thereby reducing or softening the bond yield. So you can understand whenever the demand for bond increases, their price also increases. And with increase in price, we'll see reduction in bond yield. And whenever the market or demand of bond decreases, the bond yield increases. Now let us consider the practice question. The first statement, reduction in domestic retail inflation will also increase the demand for bonds or increases the prices of bond, thereby reducing the yields of the bond. Whereas on the other hand, increase in interest rate by US Federal Reserve will mean that it will reduce the demand and prices of bonds in India, which will again increase the yield. Further, increased borrowing by the union and state government will also increase the supply of bond, thereby reducing their bond prices, which will again increase the bond yield in the economy. So how many of the above mentioned factors will result into hardening of bond yield, will, will, which also means increase in bond yield. Now it is clear from the discussion that factor 2 and 3 will increase the bond yield. Thereby option B is the correct answer to this model question. Now with this, let us move to the next article, which you can see appeared in the business line newspaper. Now this news article, it reports that NHAI has been able to raise 16,000 crore through invits. Now these invits, they are important from prelims perspective because only in 2023, a question appeared in these invits. Now what are these invits? Now as you can understand, these in invits, they are a pooled investment instrument which pools money from various investors and then this pooled money, it is utilized in investment in infrastructural assets. Now, naturally, when a sponsor brings an invit, it also encourages investors, both retail as well as institutional investors to 
undertake investment in any inbuilt and based on this money and investment manager they will allocate the investment on other important infrastructural assets now these inbuilts they are regulated by securities exchange board of india which is abbreviated as sebi now who what is the minimum subscription level both retail and domestic investors they can invest invest in this inbuilt and the minimum subscription level is rupees 1 lakh now the unit holders uh now as you can understand that these inbuilt they are pooled investment instruments which are used both to invest in debt securities as well as invest in equity markets so you can understand that when an amount of money is invested in debt it will give a return which is known as interest whereas on the other hand equity it fetches you dividend so investors they will receive returns in form of both interest and dividend now what are the taxation policy in this regard now both incomes that are interest and dividend they are subjected to be taxed by the indian government and also when an investor he receives a profit upon selling of his units the capital gains tax it is also imposed so these investments that is in which they are not exempted from taxation in any manner further the risk profile of this investments they are quite low because sebi it has regulated that at least 80 amount 80% amount of funds they should be invested in projects that have already been completed and revenue generating understood so let us solve the model question with reference to infrastructure investment trust consider the following statements the first statement these inbuilt they are regulated by sebi which again is a correct statement the second statement the inbuilt must invest only in completed and revenue generating infrastructure projects now this only makes it an absolute statement and again this is an incorrect statement because investors they are required to put at least 80% or more than 80% in an completed project and not 100% now income earned from these investment made in inbuilt they are exempted from taxation again this is an incorrect statement because you can see taxation they are applied both on interest and dividend which is earned by investors so as all these uh, sorry only one statement is correct thereby option a is the right answer now let us move to the last article of the day which also appeared in the business line newspaper now this particular news article it highlights a government scheme to promote growing of oil palm in india which is national mission on edible oils and oil palm now this scheme to promote agriculture in the country it is important from gs paper 3 perspective because the syllabus highlights food security also initiatives that are taken by government in agricultural sector they have been subject to frequent questions in the upsc so in this regard let us understand or quickly understand this particular scheme now this is a centrally sponsored scheme which means the contribution in this scheme it is made by both union as well as state governments now the nodal ministry for implementation of this scheme is ministry of farmers or sorry ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare now this scheme it targets not just to increase area under oil palm cultivation but also increase the production of crude oil in the country because it will reduce india's dependence on imports as far as needs for crude oil is concerned also there are two important feature of the scheme that do, through this scheme the government it wants to provide price assurance to the oil palm growers and this is provided through a viability gap fund which is 14.3% of the price of crude palm oil further this scheme also provides assistance for imports and interventions that most of the plantation they are provided a monetary support of up to rupees 29000 per hectare now the most important part of the scheme is that it focuses specially on the regions that is northeastern region as well as andaman and nicobar 
islands now with this information let us solve the practice question the first statement it is a central sector scheme with special focus on northeastern and andaman nicobar region now this is again an incorrect statement because it is a centrally sponsored scheme now this is an initiative of ministry of development and northeastern region which is again incorrect because it is an initiative of ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare now the target of this is to increase crude oil production to 10 lakh tons by the year 2029 and 30 which again it is an incorrect statement because it wants to increase india's crude oil production by up to 28 lakh tons so or as all these three options are incorrect thereby option d is the correct answer to this practice question so with this uh, i conclude our today's daily news simplified and we'll meet again tomorrow at 6 pm so this was all for today's dns and i bid you a very good night